This podcast is a quest for well-being, a quest for a meaningful life through the exploration of fundamental truths, enlightening ideas, insights on physical, mental, and spiritual health. The inspiration is love. The aspiration is to awaken new ways of thinking that can lead us to a new way of being, being well. Welcome to Body, Mind, and Soul Healing Conversations. <laughs> when there has been a betrayal in a relationship, This leads to an emotional injury, and if not addressed through understanding and forgiveness, it can lead to resentment or termination of the relationship. But how do you go about tackling the journey of forgiveness together? Priscilla Rodriguez says that it will not be a comfortable experience, but it can lead to a closer and more intimate relationship. In this episode, we discuss forgiveness and what the forgiveness process looks like. Valeria Tellez interviews Priscilla Rodriguez. She's a licensed marriage and family therapist in Texas and owns an online boutique private practice called Modern Wellness Counseling. Priscilla's private practice's sole mission is to give couples and individuals the tools they need to make their relationships thrive. Priscilla and her team of contract clinicians focus on helping adults reclaim their connections with others whether that be healing emotional trauma and betrayal, learning how to manage anxiety and stress, or finding ways to love oneself. Meet Priscilla at modernwellnesscounseling.com. Here's the interview with Priscilla Rodriguez. In your own words, who is Priscilla Rodriguez? Hi, yeah. So I would say um, Priscilla is a person who is passionate about working with people, who is caring about everyone and everything that is living. Um, I feel like a lot of the work that I do with my clients is not just looking at them in a particular role, but also like everything that they are. You know, I think a lot of it too, I try to do that daily, whether it's just, you know, little things like recycling or, you know, um, composting, you know, just giving back in the tiniest ways to our environment and to people around us. I would kind of say that's a bigger, like a outside of my role as just a, a therapist or as a business owner. Um, this is kind of like who I would say I am. And as for being a licensed marriage and family therapist, what inspired you to do what you do? Yeah, so I originally got really passionate about this field um, in undergrad um, when I was working in a research lab that really focused in on looking at couples and how their stress impacted their communication. So we would bring couples into a lab, we would get like a saliva sample right before they had an argument and they get a post saliva sample and kind of see how much cortisol. So it was really like technical kind of, but I really enjoyed, you know, having to code their, their conversations and these arguments and was, you know, a junior in college and trying to figure out, okay, what am I doing with my life? <laughs> right. I think we all kind of go through that moment in life. Um, so I really, figured out, okay, I can still work with people. I can help them with the communication. I enjoy learning about, you know, these daily stressors that these couples were talking about and how can I help them? So that's when I kind of learned more about therapy and then learned more about the licensed marriage and family therapy tract, how that was more focused in on working with multiple people and systems. Um, And I really fell in love with that. So that's kind of how I decided, you know, this is going to be 
the path that I'm going to take over, um, you know, social work or a licensed professional counselor. Um, that's kind of my reason why I chose the LMFT route. So in a way, what we do chooses us, right, mm -hmm. Priscilla? That's what I see a lot with um, talking to other people and myself. That's mm -hmm. interesting how it seems like we all have a calling, a purpose. Do you believe yeah. in that, that we have a specific purpose in this lifetime? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And I think it can, yeah, definitely even alter a little bit, just depending on what you're going through, what kind of season you are in life. Let me ask you another question about the big picture of purpose. What do you feel the purpose of life is? The purpose of the human experience as a whole? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I really do believe that the purpose is connecting, right? Connecting with other people, you know, especially I think that something that really kind of brought that even to life a little bit more was at the pandemic, right? A lot of people being in quarantine, kind of really finding that isolation and loneliness um, and really kind of that purpose of like just needing even just that communication. Um, we all kind of find ourselves in video calls, just trying to find those little moments of connecting with other people, um, being able to relate to others. Um, so I would definitely kind of, for me, I, I find it that that's a, a, the biggest purpose, right, is being able to connect with others and, and share our life with other people versus it just being, mm. you know, on our own. And I wonder why it's so challenging sometimes to be around people and to be in relationships, especially intimate relationships. Seems like the closer mm -hmm. we get to others, the more challenges we find. It's not mm -hmm. always the case, but most of the time. Do you have an idea why <laughs> this is? <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of it is vulnerability. Um, mm, yeah. You know, like when we're close with people, especially intimate relationships, we do you know, it's, it's always like a risk, right? You're risking the potential part of being hurt. It, it can be scary to uncover something that maybe you haven't shared with someone else or to know that it's okay. I'm going to be safe. Um, you know, given some people's backgrounds of either experiencing trauma, um, or other betrayal that, you know, some, it, we can't just like let go and always start off as a clean slate kind of thing. So I think sometimes that we do experience that, fear sometimes I get away. It seems like that's when the fears we have, they become visible to us, even mm -hmm. more visible. That is so true. And another interesting dynamic that I have uncovered in relationships that this balance between being true to ourselves and being true to others at the same time mm -hmm. has been such an interesting dance. Oh, a very interesting one. Like, I'm, I don't think it's a fun one. <laughs> it hasn't been fun for me, but it uh, has been interesting for sure. Yeah, yeah. I think it, it gives us also just like a perception, right? If we love ourselves, it's easier to accept love from other people. If it's hard to love ourselves or we're really mean to ourselves, if someone is being kind, we're much more likely to doubt it or question it, uh, you know, question their motives perhaps of they don't really mean that or... They're just saying that because they think I want to hear that, right? It's really hard to accept it um, and to believe it. So I think definitely self-love does play a role in your ability to connect. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's a very good point. So that's a very good sign also that we can clearly see when we are not there when it comes to loving ourselves because we are doubting the love of others and we mm -hmm. don't trust. That makes so much sense, Priscilla. So I'll be asking you more questions in a moment about uh, relationships and forgiveness. Mm -hmm. But for now, let me ask you another open question about love. What is your idea of what love is? Yeah, I mean, I feel like love is such a big, <laughs> a big construct, right, that everyone's trying to figure out. Um, but for me, I would say love is the ability to feel safe, the ability to feel wanted, you know, I think whenever I, I, I work a lot with couples, so I feel like that's always kind of in the <laughs> forefront of my mind is being seen, being respected, being wanted and safe, safe enough to to be able to explore those different areas. Because I think without that, it's really hard to to go about doing certain, you know, taking risks, whether that's 
with work or with your families or your own interests and passions, like it's hard to kind of take some risk without that self-love or ability to receive love from other people. So I would definitely kind of say it's that part to feel safe for sure. Talk to me for a moment about your understanding of healing and also the obstacles to healing. Yeah. Yeah. So I think for as far as healing, you know, there's this part of acceptance. I think sometimes we, you know, when I work with my certain clients um, who have experienced some kind of hurt, right, whether it's emotional or physical, they sometimes believe like, oh, I just have to get over it. I just have to get over it and move on. Um, but then all of a sudden it feels like a self-betrayal of, you know, dismissing yourself. So I think when it comes to healing, it's also that part of accepting the pain of, oh, it makes sense. This is why I feel this way. Of course, I feel this way. Um, this is what happened to me. And now this is how I'm going to overcome it by telling, you know, acknowledging that pain. I'm accepting what, what has happened and being able to move forward now um, by implementing, you know, other coping skills, depending on what it is that is going on. Um, but I think a big part of healing is also acceptance and, and recognizing that it's okay, right? Especially if it's something that was, you know, sometimes with healing, there can be like self-blame, you know, I should have seen that. I should, I should have stopped it. I should have known, right? So there's kind of this blame that happens. So I think being able to overcome that too is is important um, in order to move forward, yeah, from healing. I remember that being the first step when I kind of, opened my heart and mind to healing, healing myself from childhood abuse and all that. And my mother was at the center of it. And I remember that was the first word that came to me when trying to describe what had happened, how I was feeling better after I had mm-hmm. written about the whole, all the events and everything. Acceptance was mm-hmm. a key kind of description for the feelings that I had. Mm-hmm. So that makes so much sense. And I do have a question for you. We'll talk in the moment about the steps to forgiveness. But mm-hmm. before that, do you see a difference between forgiveness and acceptance? Um, I would say so. Um, I feel like acceptance is just like, of course, understanding what, what happened, right? That, okay, I recognize, acknowledge what is going on. And forgiveness is that part of, you know, that second piece of, this is what happened and this is now what we're doing differently, right? So um, um, forgiveness is that also ability to be vulnerable again, right? Because I think sometimes we can accept certain pains and certain things and then we set up, you know, we forgive the person and it's just like, okay, but I'm going to choose to not continue the relationship or I'm going to choose to kind of move on on my own, right? But when we're talking forgiveness within the relationship, it's allowing yourself to be vulnerable again, Um, so that's kind of how I see it when it comes to relationships. Would you say that I'm trying to translate that within my own experience of what that is? Would you say being able to love again, if we will be trade, for example, in a relationship by forgiving, then we would open the heart again. Would Mm -hmm. that be a good example or not really? Yeah, I would say so. I would say, yeah, the ability to love someone and also accept someone else's love as being true would be forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Wow, it's such an an interesting topic that I I have been talking to my mother-in-law because she Mm -hmm. often says that she has not forgiven some people in the family and some of her her kids. And I usually listen because Mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, with older people, it's really, um, it's such a challenge to... um, even to talk about these things, right? We we need to be open. Would you say that being open to healing is to forgiveness is the first step to get there? I would say so. Yeah, I think definitely is that um, identifying what happened and kind of understand like, hey, I'm accepting what's going on. And I'm just going to tell myself, you know, I'm ready for this, right? I'm ready to take this first step. And that's definitely kind of that first step to forgiveness and healing, definitely. Do you have any spiritual practices, Priscilla, or any spiritual views or belief systems? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do enjoy to meditate a lot. And I do believe in a, you know, kind of 
universe, um, higher power kind of thing. I don't practice a particular religion, but I think for, for myself, it's more the spirituality of, you know, there, there is something bigger, right? I, I often reference it as just like the universe. But yeah, I, w- I would definitely say that I practice that through daily meditations and just being intentional with how I'm thinking a lot of times. I hear a lot and you read a lot about the power of going within, which mm-hmm. meditation facilitates that, of course. But then I was thinking, yeah, yesterday or today about that sometimes it's so clear because it's fast too. It doesn't take too long to know like what's calling us in life. How much do we need really to go deeper inside when it comes to finding truth about ourselves? It seems like that would it's very helpful when it comes to healing more than finding our calling. I don't know. I have been reflecting about this these days. Yeah, yeah. Agree, right? I mean, I think that's it is just kind of dependent on, I think, going back to like the fears, perhaps. You know, there may be things that you're a little bit more fearful or worried, like, oh, I don't want to make that same mistake again or um, don't want to make the wrong choice or it just being something completely new that you're really having to kind of dig a little bit deeper of, what is this going to be like for me? I kind of love the idea that life is always trying to show us in the external, like, you know, what the next step is or what we are supposed to be engaging with in this moment. I really believe that being present mm-hmm. and just paying attention to what's calling me now in this moment. So you own a, a company called Modern Wellness Counseling. Mm-hmm. And we talked briefly off record about also this dance between healing and business. Mm-hmm. How do you do it? <laughs> and what's the purpose of your company? Yeah, so Modern Wellness Counseling was is a counseling practice. So we are an online group practice where we specialize in working with couples, um, couples who are looking to overcome you know, their own betrayals, infidelity, um, own traumas, reconnecting, uh, because they kind of like lost that spark or, you know, just life has thrown, you know, everything at them and they're trying to figure out who they are again as a couple. Um, We also work with individuals who who are experiencing anxiety, depression, self-esteem issues, um, just wanting to identify healthy coping skills for stress or burnout. Um, and, and I think a lot of it, that's kind of the, a lot of the work that we do as clinicians when working with clients. And I say we, cause it's a, it's a group of us. I'm, I'm the owner and founder, but there's also other clinicians as well who work with clients. And, and yeah, I think going back to that first question of, were you referencing like healing as a, oh, yes. as a business owner? Right. Yes. Yeah. How do you balance that? Doing healing work and then business work. <laughs> Although I, I do the same in a way. Right. Yeah. I think personally it is that um, I think it was, oh gosh, wow. It's been three years now, <laughs> um, two, three years now where I really had to remind myself to take care of me. So I try very hard, you know, to stick with my routine of in the mornings, engaging in meditations, taking care of my body physically, working out, um, being a therapist. I It's very sedentary, so I sit a lot. Maybe I'll do some sessions standing, um, but kind of just recognizing and you know, listening to my body of what what is it needing? Because I without me taking care of myself and healing from those pieces, it's, it can be hard to give back. Um, so I think that was something that I learned a couple of years ago of, okay, like if I'm going to do this, not only for my clients, but be a business owner and, have, you know, other clinicians in my, in my practice, I have to really pay more attention to how am I treating myself along the way. Um, so I think there is that balance of just like, like these daily, like, it's almost like daily recovery, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> Mental and emotional recovery. Interesting because it's easy to kind of say that to others, right? Give those yeah. amazing advice, but then <laughs> a lot of times we, we forget to practice ourselves, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, we keep giving and then we don't stop to receive. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's, mm, that's a beautiful message, though. We all need to be reminded of that. Healers in general, or mm-hmm. therapists, anybody who is engaging in giving, uh, just being also open to receiving. So, and that's how I define love anyway. Love, this dynamic of giving and receiving, this beautiful dance. 
So let's talk about steps to forgiveness. This is a blog post that you have written. So mm -hmm. talk to me about them, Priscilla. I know you have, let me see, five steps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I wrote this blog um, because I was thinking a lot of like the couples I was working with. A lot of the couples that come to us are, like I mentioned, in wanting to work past or work through a betrayal that maybe has recently happened or they tried to recover it and heal from it on their own, but maybe things have not worked out as they initially planned. So betrayal can mean, you know, there was some lying that was involved. There was an infidelity or an affair. You know, there were some boundaries that were overstepped, whether it's with family or friends. Um, so something has happened within the relationship that there's this betrayal. Whenever I work with couples who are experiencing this, I talk a lot about it in relation to trauma. Emotional trauma is kind of what, what has just happened. And anytime we're talking about trauma, we have we see very similar signs of like PTSD, right? Post-traumatic stress disorder. We experience these unwanted triggers, these intrusive thoughts. Um, and this is what happens when in within a relationship where there has been betrayal and it's not kind of triaged right away, if you will. So when that doesn't happen, it can definitely lead to resentment in the relationship um, or just ending the relationship altogether, right? Because there's this sense of my partner doesn't care about me. So when talking about these steps, the first step is really for both people in the relationship or both partners to identify and, and recognize what happened that led to the emotional injury, what was going on, um, you know, to cause that emotional injury. Because I think sometimes it's the person who gets injured may be able to say, hey, that was hurtful. And the other person may say, it wasn't that big of a deal or, you know, that was five years ago. Um, none of that is, you know, helpful. Right? Uh, <laughs> that's like, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think yeah. it's first being able to just identify like what, what happened? What, what was that event that led to that? Have you been in contact with any client who have come across unforgiving experiences or situations? Or do you mm -hmm. acknowledge something like an experience that you would consider to be unforgiving? Yeah, I think it's, there's, I definitely have had clients who have been able to acknowledge and say, you know, and I get that this has happened, but the fact that it, you know, happened, you know, they can go through all the steps, right? But the fact that it happened they are unable to open up their heart again, right? To be loved and to love that other person in, in a vulnerable relationship again. You know, they may not be able to get back to that part of feeling safe, feeling secure anymore. So for them, they have to, you know, important pieces to feel safe. And if they have to do that individually outside the relationship, you know, they're still forgiving the partner, you know, like, hey, thank you for going through this process with me. Like I happily that you understand now, but it's still too hard to move forward, right, together. And I often let couples know when I work with them, you know, my job isn't to save the relationship, right, or staying in the relationship doesn't equal success all the time. Um, you know, sometimes it, for them, they realize this isn't, you know, best for me, for my own mental health or emotional health. Um, so, yeah, there, there have been instances I think big outliers, you know, have been finding out of a different family kind of thing or, you know, yeah. So like it wasn't just an emotional affair or a one night stand. You know, there was this, you know, whole other reality happening. So the second step that I outlined was that for the partner who had been injured to really be able to identify what they are experiencing and emotionally feeling and um, be able to verbalize that with their with their partner who injured them an actual and when I work with couples or you know even individuals I always let them know like but what is that emotion like name the emotion right sometimes they'll say well I feel like they don't you know like they just did xyz right they they cheated yeah. on me or they were talking to someone else like no, no no like how does that what is that emotion right is that emotion embarrassment is it betrayal is it disrespect is it anger um so really kind of labeling the, the emotion versus kind of the, the event. Um, sometimes people can get lost in that. 
and being able to really verbalize that to the other party, right? The, the their partner. And I think a lot of times it's being able to focus in, you know, we talked a little bit about looking within, right? And it, it can be a little scary to slow down and and say like, well, no, like they, they need to be getting in trouble, right? My partner, my partner did the wrong thing. They need to like get it, right? So all the focus is there versus really kind of acknowledging, wait a second, what am I feeling right now? What am I going through? Because without them being able to say that to their partner, their partner is not going to understand, right? All they see is, here's my partner who's upset again because of something I did five years ago, right? And the, and that's often what they say, right? <laughs> that's often, And it doesn't, nothing gets healed or forgiven at that point. So the second step would be to really, for the injured party to really identify what, what is that emotion and being able to verbalize it and share that. Yeah, that's interesting. My husband said, I think it was two days ago, he said, I don't feel appreciated. Mm. And that was interesting to hear that from him because yeah. he was labeling, right? The feeling that he was mm-hmm. feeling. Yeah, you made me think about that now. I got to appreciate him yeah. more. <laughs> I got to show more of <laughs> my appreciation. <laughs> yeah. So step, I think it's step three now, right, Priscilla? Yeah, yeah, the injuring part, yeah. Yeah, so the third step would be for the injuring partner to be able to listen and acknowledge the pain that their partner is sharing and engage in active listening, right? So what this means is really letting the other partner know of, I get it, you know, I hear you saying that when I was speaking to this other man that you felt disrespected and you felt really embarrassed um, and now you feel unsafe to open up to me, right? versus, um, well, I was only speaking to the other man because he didn't pay attention to me, right? So so it's not defending yourself or, you know, giving them reason as to why you did it. It's really listening, acknowledging the pain that the person just took. You know, we just talked about how much work and how vulnerable the person has to be to open up, right? So we have to kind of for the that partner to pay attention to like oh wow my partner just said something very different right they weren't blaming me they were saying something very different and now i have in to kind of lean into that when i work with couples it can be hard right for the injuring partner to to listen to the pain so then they'll just kind of either do the self blame well which is um it can sound a little like I knew it, right? I, I'm a bad partner, and this is why we shouldn't be together, right? So all of a sudden, they start bashing themselves. They're still not listening to their partner when they do that, right? They're still not listening to their pain and acknowledging it. Um, so I think this is a big, another big step of allowing yourself to listen mm-hmm. to the other side. And then step four, I have there here in front of me, you wrote the injury partner verbalize how they are taking responsibility. So that's the first. Mm-hmm. Right. How do we know when we are communicating, verbalizing in the way that it's showing that we are taking responsibility? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think the focus, the focus stays on the emotion, right? And kind of links the part of my behavior led to this emotion that you're now experiencing. It stays there versus kind of going back up to well, I only did this because you did XYZ or, you know, or yes, you know, I did that because I'm such a bad person, right? So all of a sudden, it it steers away from the emotion. Um, so I think with, when focusing in, taking responsibility and being really empathic, right? It's staying with the emotion and it's staying very soft and involved, right? What I mean by that is that tone of voice kind of sounds like how you and I are talking right now, right? It's, you know, it can be very soft and the other person it's they're able to listen right the moment that we start speaking very fast or the tone of voice changes inflection changes we naturally tense up right we get a little scared and concerned so i think that's also another part where it can be really you know there's a lot of things happening all at once and i let couples know this you know but but it's so important to just like remember like if my partner for them to know that I really get them, like these are, this is how they have to hear it. This is what is going on, right? If I'm just like, okay, fine, I get it. Yeah, thanks for telling me, right? That's not gonna, that's right. not gonna be polite. <laughs> right. And there's, 
something interesting, I mean, funny about emotions that it speeds up everything. I notice that when it, we feel really strongly about something, then it's uh, we tend to speak faster. You're right. And mm -hmm. change the tone of voice. And the human experience is just incredibly, mm -hmm. I don't know, vast. I love the idea that we can kind of hold space for those emotions. I mean, for mm -hmm. all of them to just show up and be there. Maybe not an explosive way, but sometimes it needs to be too. So it's, yeah. I love the idea of being authentic when it comes to emotions. But it's still aware, but self-aware, very right. aware of them. And then step five, right? So yeah, talk to me about that. That's the last one on mm -hmm. your list. Yeah, so I think it's finally at this stage or this step where both partners can then share their willingness to stay in the relationship and work together, right? Now they are able to kind of say, I'm willing to work towards opening my heart again, right? being able to move forward, finding different ways of creating a new relationship, or this is a place where, you know, they say, I do forgive you, but I'm not, you know, I no longer feel safe or want to take that risk anymore of moving forward, right? So, so that is something that they have to kind of come to an agreement, right, or decision on their own. But if they do say, you know, I'm willing to work on the relationship now, that this is where some of that healing work starts to happen of, okay, let's kind of back up a little bit. What was going on in the relationship before the betrayal? Um, so that we were aware of not to repeat those things, right? I let couples know we don't want to go back to where things used to be because that's what led you here and we don't want to be here again. So it's really having to recreate a whole new relationship and, and how they speak to one another, how they treat one another, what those expectations are. And, and along the way, remembering that there's still going to be triggers. Right? There's going to be moments of feeling scared of, I see you on your phone all the time. You know, that's, a, that's a big one, a common one that comes up whenever there's been a betrayal. So how do you, how do you talk about that without it escalating again to you're slipping that up, that was five years ago, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Wow. So do you see most people that you work with taking that chance of rebuilding the relationship or giving up? Most of them just give up. I feel like the majority that come to me or, or come to us are wanting to make the relationship work and they just don't know how to do that, right? Because they, all they see and are experiencing when they come to us is that fear. So we really have to kind of work on it by going through some of these steps of forgiveness and understanding where that fear is coming from before being able to really rebuild. Yeah, because I think sometimes they just want, of course, they're in pain. So they just, you know, what's the quickest, fastest way to get rid of this pain? But it's having to, you know, triage it, right? When you apply pressure to a wound, it's never comfortable, but it has to be done in order for it to kind of heal a little bit. So, so that's kind of what what happens in the beginning it's also dependent on timing um is this a betrayal they just found out about the night before the week before is it something that's been ongoing for years so couples who come to us where it's it just happened the you know those are the ones who kind of want it a little bit faster but then you know once we kind of go through on, you know this process they understand oh, okay this isn't <laughs> just night and day kind of thing um, there has to be work on both ends. Thank you so much, Priscilla, for doing what you do again, for yeah. being you. Yeah, that's so important in our reality these days. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're almost at the end. I do have a few more questions for you, the ending questions. Would you like to add anything else that we didn't discuss or covered today? Um, I think it's just recognizing that, yeah, here are these steps. It's a lot easier said than done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, you said that. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of vulnerability and it's a lot of trust in yourself. I think sometimes it can feel like, you know, the ground's going to swallow me up or I can't, you know, stand up. But sometimes it is just having to trust yourself of, you know, I am able to do this. And I think especially with betrayal, it's having to really trust you versus really the other person, right? Is because you're kind of the only person that moment that can hold yourself up sometimes. How do you define success these days? What is to be successful to you? Yeah, I think success is more of um, for for me, it's the progress that is being made. I think 
for so long and personally in my life, it's been so numerical, <laughs> um, right? If you think of like grade school, I was in graduate school, I was okay, running a business. Um, you look at numbers all the time. So I think it's sometimes like, I need to reach this number. Or I need to reach this next you know, thing. But I think for, for me, it's, you know, going back to day to day, it's, oh, I was successful today because I made this progress, right? I, I mean, you know, we may not be able to do this by this date or, you know, my business may not be at this point by, you know, April 1st or whatever it may be, but, you know, I'm on the right track. And I think something that's giving myself that praise um, and acknowledgement, because um, I think for different stages of my life, it, I used to be really mean, right, of like, you didn't do it on time or you could have done it better or um, comparison, so-and-so did that in two months, why is it taking you four months, you know, whatever maybe. So I think, you know, going back to a couple of years ago when really taking care of me, this was a big mental shift that I had to change to of success. And something that I share with my clients too, of hearing all the little wins and helping them understand those wins throughout the week, you know, sure, maybe they're still experiencing triggers or maybe they're, of course, still having intrusive thoughts but so okay how did you handle it what was different this time so that, that awareness piece is definitely a success in that moment so it goes back to the idea of self-kindness isn't it being kind to oneself and being self-aware enough to see when we are not kind mm -hmm. uh, i love that message too of course it's one close to my heart because i have been talking about forever and <laughs> i'm writing about mm -hmm. it never leaves me in that message so thank you for saying that again and my last question is, what three experiences you wish everyone to have before they lose the body, before they die? Apart from self-kindness, that's a giving to me. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good um, question. I would definitely say love, giving yourself permission to be loved by a partner, romantic partner, family member, friend, nature. I think that's an important piece of just being willing to, to accept. Um Yes, I think there's a there's definitely that part with love of feeling connected, right? Feeling a part of something. So I would definitely say giving yourself permission to be loved. And what another one would be giving back. You know, I think there's it's so rewarding if you find a way to give back to your community, your family, um, your environment. And it can be the smallest things of turning off my light and being very mindful of the water usage or <laughs> composting um, to I'm going to volunteer on a monthly basis. You know, it, it can be big or small. I think sometimes just being able to give back is, is very, you know, that that's that another way of sharing, right. And connecting. And I think another one would be um, something that I've recently, recently myself personally have, fell in love with which is just embracing and being in nature I think I myself like with school and with growing a business got really consumed with being on my phone being on my laptop um you know reading and doing more things you know but took very little time to be outside you know, mm, just like, right. <laughs> um, right. so recently you know that's something that I started with the you know with the pandemic and shutdown was okay let me go on hikes let me do these other things and really embracing the outdoors and a passion that kind of grew from that was well wow, like I it took a pandemic for me to, <laughs> to uh, yeah it's not funny <laughs> yeah um, so, so I think it's definitely you know finding finding different ways of embracing nature you know again that can be big or small um, but I think it's it's very rewarding um, and, and humbling too when once you start to kind of see, you know, little things that we do as an individual that can go back to helping the planet <laughs> and our environment. So. Oh, my God. How many yes can I say? A billion to that, too. <laughs> I love your wisdom. I love how aware you are. You're very young, but so open to life. Thank you so much, Priscilla, for being you. Yeah, thank you, of course. Yeah, it's truly beautiful. 
So my last question is a technical one. Where can we find more information about you, your work, services, products, and future projects? Yeah, so my website is my business name, which is modernwellnesscounseling.com. Um, I'm also active on Instagram, Facebook, and recently trying to dabble with TikTok. Ah, yeah. <laughs> so that's uh-huh. also the handle is Modern Wellness Counseling. And that's normally where I share a lot of my online courses. Um, I have, you know, we offer online therapy pra- or online therapy sessions in, for residents of Texas. But if you're not a resident of Texas, we also offer online courses. Therapy is not part of that or is not a substitute for therapy but we do cover a lot of the relationship skills and tools that we teach within our sessions so that's all in a course as well um, which can be found on our website wonderful i'll have the link on your podcast profile too thank you so much again priscilla and we'll talk soon all righty take good care bye for now yeah, thank you Thank you for listening. To learn more about Priscilla Rodriguez and her work, please visit modernwellnesscounseling.com. To learn more about this podcast, please visit fitforjoy.org/podcast. Thank you again for listening and bye for now.